well welcome everyone to another video um, yesterday I was in London at GB News I did two slots um, uh, are mainly to do with COP28 and some of the virtue signaling going on in the world with biofuels um, so um, there's quite a few things actually come out of this and I think this is quite a good way to explain issues because by me going over it and just doing a dissection but adding information background it actually um, helps I think everyone understand how to counter the madness of climate alarmism and so without without further ado I'm going to cut straight in to the first slot um, with Nana Nukia. Good afternoon. If you've just tuned in, where have you been? Sorry, you've only missed 21 minutes. It's fine. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. I'm Nana Aquir. It's just fast approaching 22 minutes after 3 o'clock, and we are live on TV, online, and on digital radio. And it's time for climate control. We unpick some of the debate around the climate. So while global warming talks have been underway this week in Dubai at COP28, the first aircraft with 100% sustainable jet fuel took flight from London, Heathrow, to New York. York. Previous flights have had a 50% sustainable fuel, but following this success, there are hopes that the transport sector will be able to decarbonise travel in the future. But does it mark a new frontier in sustainable aviation? We'll also talk weather. I'm joined now to discuss uh, with meteorologist and social commentator Jim Dale and also climate and so scientist Paul Burgess. Paul, I want to start with you. Let's talk aviation. Now, this, this biofuel... Mm -hmm. Is it a good move? Everyone's sort of talking about it as though it's a fantastic no. advancement. It's not. Take, let me give you an example. If you take Europe, how much biofuel it uses, it uses a landmass bigger than the whole island of Ireland. That's north and south together. Bigger, I think it's 9.6 million hectares. So that's how much land you need currently to supply the biofuel being supplied to Europe. That land, if it was just left as vegetation, mm. would actually have twice the CO2 reduction of the biofuels. Oh, I get it. So that's number one. Number two, that land, if it was uh, uh, made into crops, you know, used, would feed 120 million people. And in actual fact, the Oxfam, the Oxfam climate, um, I think Julie somebody, the Oxfam person said, it's a crime to use biofuel. So just to recap there, this is what Oxfam say, and they're right. The EU's choice is also deadly for the planet. European policymakers are perpetuating a false climate solution by promoting the use of biofuels. Growing crops for fuel not only takes the land that could be used to absorb um, carbon, but it even causes more greenhouse emissions than the fossil fuels they replace. Biofuels do nothing to fight the climate crisis and only harm the planet. EU governments must stop the madness and rule on the burning of fossil fuels for fuel in their national laws. Well, I disagree, of course, about the fossil fuel element and, and so on. All that's rubbish. But as regards biofuels, Oxfam and I see eye to eye, and that is what I was highlighting there. So let's proceed. But Keep they're going. using chip fat, though, so he was using chip fat and stuff like that, oil, it's a vegetable oil, yeah, waste, not, waste product. Nothing wrong in using reusing waste. That's just natural conservation and mm. housekeeping. Nothing wrong, totally support that. But you can't use that for aeroplanes. So what you'd end up with is this. You'd end up with a transatlantic flight, in my research, around about 500 um, dollars or 500 pounds more per flight per ticket uh, and you'd, you'd, you'd actually be doing away with vast waves of, of, of the planet making fuel it is a ridiculous proposition and it's virtue signaling you see the problem for richard branson here is that he's got to find an excuse to keep on flying with this fossil fuel madness now in my world he can carry on flying because that's not the problem the co2 the carbon's not the problem but he goes to it, the only solution he can think of even though it's very damaging and this is a perfect example of green policies actually damaging the planet and damaging food production and so on it's madness and i haven't even bothered to mention the rainforest being cut down in brazil for biofuel production you could go on around the world it's total madness so let's not do it. Jim Dale. I kind of think it's a little bit of a gimmick, actually. Um, I, I, you know, I don't wish to disagree in this, on, on this one. Um, I think any, any trial, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've got um, purpose behind it, if there is science behind it, and if that's going to go forward, then fine. Any, anything is, is, is good to try. I think that's what scientists do. Mm. Uh, there's no problem with that. But... but I don't know. I mean, I'm going to ask Paul. What, 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 what do you think? What do you think the reason is for for Virgin Atlantic doing this? Do you... oh, pure virtue signaling. I, I mean, the whole 
the, the whole of what we're going through now with COP and everything is pure virtue signalling. And, that's, and a, that's a different subject. No, yeah. no, well, no, no. It's the next subject, actually. No, it has, no, no, I'll do, yeah, I'll do I, that. I, I, that I could bring up my first graph. Uh, that could be brought up. Well, let's put up the first Paul's first graph. He's got a graph here. Yeah. And uh, so we said that it's we promised to put him on the screen. It's the same point. So let's see. It's coming up. Keep talking. So what does that mean? What is that? What well, that? That is the CO2 growth. It's the internationally accepted. It's at the Mauna Loa, top of Hawaii mountain. It's what everyone quotes when you say 418 parts per million now. Yeah. But, but uh, someone has plotted on Tony Heller, actually, has plotted on all the different climate conferences. That make no difference. If you look at the curve, it's curving up like that. CO2 is increasing in all that way and it makes no difference at all what they're doing a meeting in COP28 with 70,000 representatives none at all this graph proves it and I what I put on there is a famous saying insanity is something like repeating the same thing many times over and expecting a different result that's what COP is well, what do you think Jim they're, they're all at COP they're flying there they're going flying there by private jets a lot of them I think we've got three going we've got Rishi in his jet you've got the King in his jet I think you've got David Cameron in it could have gone all together that would have been nice wouldn't it well, uh, well, but, but I suppose their, their thoughts are if anything happens you've lost your Prime Minister your King and well there's a David bit of Cameron that. okay yeah <laughs> no, I, I, look I, I take that I, I do take that but in terms of ha having the cost they're there for a reason and especially the Paris one of several years ago with yeah. the Paris Agreement so, they, so behind the scenes particularly they do arrive at consensus stuff you don't necessarily See, I think there was something that came out today to say that uh, the uh, the uh, uh, ke uh, petrochemical uh, industries, 50 of them, were going to going to limit the, the methane um, emissions. So, little bit by bit, I think for the right direction. But the, the, I think the point is. Number one, those, that CO2 is still going up on Paul's graph. It's going up like, like, almost like the I agree. Idea. So I that's, agree. that's, that's, that's the wrong that. direction. But what and do you we, say it's the wrong direction? And, and, and a lot of well, people would say that CO2 going up isn't a bad thing. Uh, it's not a bad thing because more CO2 doesn't... It's not the control knob of the well, climate. it actually shows... I know we disagree on that. Yeah, it shows the temperature profile because I've got a chart, if they can put that one up, yeah, uh, showing the, t the temperature profile put it up. globally across the world. And you'll see what's happening in... in uh, 2023. I think we're probably all aware of that. Anybody who hasn't noticed what's been going on on the on the climate, there we go. So the red one is uh, is 2023. Yeah. Compared to every other year in past. I mean, it just, can I just make a few points? So we had the Tonga eruption in 20 last year, which put about 10 to 12 percent more. Uh, oh, I don't think more. That, more more water vapour in the atmosphere, yeah, which is a huge greenhouse gas. So you have to allow for that. That's why climate is not about a year or two. It's about a long time. I keep saying well, that. Th th and underneath that, the blue is the long time. Let's make that absolutely clear. How long does clear. that go back? So how long does that... uh, I can't quite see it from here, well, but I think it's back to... Yeah, it's yeah I know. It's back to, back to the 18-somethings, isn't it? Um, oh, 1840, 1850, something of that nature. Yeah. So how many years is 1850s? What was that? Well, that's Come modern. On, that's yeah. modern meteorology. That's how we measure these things. That's how we've done it. And before then, tree rings, ice cores, soil samples, etc. That's, that's what, what geologists also, do. Isn't it just wonderful when the truth shines through and your opposition on the climate actually give you information to help you and not them, and because they don't know enough about the subject. And I think this is one example. So I'm going to explain this graph because I don't think even Jim understands the graph he's offered us up here. So let's go into that explanation now. The graph is actually not the dates that they said there. It's 1850 to 1900 as a baseline. It's not recording temperature. It's recording a temperature anomaly, which is the difference between that average period from 1850 to 1900 and uh, the time on the graph. And the graph goes from the left hand at the bottom, 1940 to 2023 along the bottom. So let's look at this further. Well, let's just look at this little peak here. This would be about, what, 1950-ish? And that was higher. That was higher than today. Just take the line across there. Well, if you actually take a line from here to here, you'll see that the temperatures really haven't changed. They've just gone through the different, the, you know, the different cycles. What this graph shows is that it was hotter back in, say, about 1950 than it is today in 2023, that there are different cycles. And um, of late, there is um, no more warming at all. In fact, there hasn't been any warming, according to this, since about what well, it covers a span of 80 years, so the last 40 years. 
So for the last 40 years, we haven't had any warming, folks. In actual fact, this graph is produced by the EU department on uh, one of their things on climate change run by the EU. And it's a work of incredible incompetence without even a scale across the bottom. And um, But it's attempting to show alarm. Um, but the people are that incompetent, they've managed to show the opposite. Amazing. Doesn't it also depend on where you take the tree ring from or the, the soil sample? Or, I, you know, doesn't it really depend? And so the fact is that you can sort of extrapolate from that to, data. To a degree, of you course must it consider. would. So, for example, I, if you're taking the temperature of something and you take it at an airport, you have to acknowledge that you've taken it at an airport and therefore that is a spurious calculation. I think to geologists and climatologists do think about these things. They are eminent people. No, they uh, they've got qualification. And, and that's why they do what they do. That's well, how well, they arrive well, at these, said, uh, these charts. They don't. No, no, I'll give you an example. The Connollys are a family of great scientists in Ireland, in Dublin, um, with Willie Sooner, who's a, um, a, a, a you know, climate scientist, did a survey of European weather stations. Mm. Of the, all the hundreds they surveyed, and a lot of the station gets hidden by people, all they could get hold of, 75% of them had entered an urban heat island. Mm. In other words, a station was there day one in a field, and then the town grew and grew. And we've got ridiculous situations in America where you end up with a temperature station surrounded by cars in a car park that years ago was in a field. So the urban heat island effect is what we're measuring. You might as well start measuring temperatures by putting a two-bar electric fire in your lounge and measuring Paul, it. It doesn't work like that, Paul. It I, does I, I work. Can, I, can I, was in charge, I was in charge of climate stations say, for Wales. As a, as a meteorologist, I, I see where these things are located. You can't call Aberporth or Aviemore, for example, very, very rural stations. You can't say that they are in the same block as, say, Heathrow Airport. Exactly. And and all of that is taken into consideration. Well, you agree on that, though, don't you, though? We're, He's saying what you're saying. That's right. I'm, I'm saying that saying the, the, there is a diverse range, a diverse range, in the, and the graph doesn't go up like the face of the eiger, just simply because we, we're just taking it from Heathrow Airport or Coningsby or, or pick another airport. You know, it doesn't work like that. Jimmy, it, these, it, these are extrapolated from, from stations. Jim, I deal with the wide. detail of this. Oh, dear, oh, dear again, Jim. What he's saying here is... It's a BS, I'm afraid. I'll be polite. It's it's absolute BS. Because if you include stations that are in urban heat island effects, then it skews the result to make it warmer, which is exactly what I've been claiming. Of course you don't do this. I, I, I mean, you know, I've been in charge of these monitoring stations. I know about it. You cannot do that. And to argue that it sort of balances itself out over time is absurd, Jim. Totally absurd. He just invents these things, you know. It really is ridiculous. Anyway, I'll let him carry on. He's burying himself very well here. Okay. I, I and the Paul, sea as well. Paul, Paul. I deal with the detail of this. I can I can forward you the scientific papers or the surveys and this, etc. And and there's no doubt at all we are recording the urban. I'll give you a perfect example. So bad was this in America. So bad. They set up what's called the Standard Reference Network. The Standard Reference Network are the hundred perfect climate stations. I agree. Perfect. Even triple redundancy. The whole gear. We all agree. Great. Set up in 2005. Yes? That is going to be now the measurement of the change in temperature for North America. Do you know what? No warming at all since then. But, but listen, That's the problem. even if you just have one location, say Heathrow Airport, it's been there for donkey's years. The graph still goes upwards. It does, no, no, you can't changed. use them at all. Nothing's changed. No, it has, actually. All Apart right. from Heathrow the temperature Airport, graph. Heathrow Airport in the 1940s was very different to Heathrow Airport today. Well, I suppose wherever I do a freeze frame, I'm going to look a bit silly. Yes, the, the point here, of course, is Heathrow has grown a lot and the urban heat island effect and the heat and the planes and everything else, the traffic, everything has grown a lot. So Heathrow as a station has warmed over the years. Of course it has. You simply can't include urban heat island temperatures inside a data set meant to record the ambient temperature of the Earth. It is as simple as that. And all the BS he's inventing with this appeal to authority, they must know what they're doing argument, is exactly what I'm saying. They don't know what they're doing. Well, they maybe do know what they're doing, and they're doing it intentionally, which is even worse. The temperature was also used to claim a UK hot record. So the individual days, peak temperature was used as claiming we are warming up, we're having records. So <laughs> that in itself is so wrong.
Mm, well, that's the point. Listen, you two, you can come back for another one in about half an hour because we're going to be discussing more on that. That is, of course, Jim Dale, meteorologist and uh, social commentator. And Paul Burgess is a climate scientist. <laughs> Fast approaching 23 after 4. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. I'm Nana Aquir. Welcome on board. It's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, should, should COP28 have been done online? Now, Rishi Sunak has been accused of climate hypocrisy for flying in a private jet to Dubai as he pledges £1.6 billion for climate projects. He's been slammed for setting an awful example as the King and Lord Cameron also travelled in their own jets. The Prime Minister has also come under fire for spending more time on the plane to COP28 than actually at the summit itself. He clocked up 11 hours in Dubai, but the round trip took 14. Now, Sunak argued it's hugely simplistic to measure the impact of our contribution in hours spent at the summit. This man of late has been totally deceitful about this extension to 2035 on the car issue because what he's done at the same time and it's actually passing through the tomorrow as i make this video the monday i'm making this on the sunday after that broadcast um it, a, a law is passing through parliament that, that, that basically forces a huge subsidy uh, 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 onto evs and you know who's paying for it oh the people who buy um, diesel and petrol cars with up to £15,000 a car penalty for selling one unless you sell the right ratio. It is This man is just deceitful. But on top of that, he, he flies out like this, totally hip, hypocritically, and on top of that, spends a lot of our money, you know, one and a half billion or something, on giving it away. He's an expert at spending money, our money, not his money, our money. And this is what our politicians do. They spend and waste our money on a grand scale so they can look good with their political friends abroad. That's it. But let's get back to the discussion. So for the Great British debate this hour, I'm asking, should COP28 have been done online? Well, joining me now to discuss is meteorologist and social commentator Jim Dale, Paul Burgess, climate scientist, Brian Catt, physicist, engineer, and there's one other person there. Oh, Donak McCarthy. So have I said it right? Donak. Donaka. Thank you very much. It was a tricky one to say. Donaka McCarthy. There's a lot of N's and H's and lots of things going on there, but great name. He's a director of Climate Media Coalition. So I'm going to start with you, Donaka. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think, yeah, thank you for this debate. I think it's an important one. I think COP should go ahead, but you're right. The hypocrisy of using private jets to go there is, is ridiculous. Um, just to give you an example, the 14 hours of the jet that the Prime Minister undertook is the equivalent of uh, uh, 14 tonnes of carbon, which is uh, 14 years of a household's emissions. So to take a household that have to turn everything off their electricity for 14 years to make up that carbon. So what we should do is have a COP, ban all the oil lobbyists and the airline lobbyists, get the prime ministers round the table and finally make an agreement. Because, Nana, this has been going on for 30 years mm. and emissions have gone up every year to, after every COP. It's failing. So mm. what do we do is get the oil dictatorships out of it. The oil dictators, 20 oil dictators are in there blocking the action, wasting the time, wasting the money, whilst the emergency is getting worse and worse around the planet. Mm. All right, uh, Brian Cat. I didn't know where to start. It is a 70,000 person boondoggle of people with their hands out from the third world who are actually going to burn coal and gas. But the key point about it is that the assumption that carbon dioxide emissions are any kind of serious problem, because we know from the measurements that we've only warmed a degree since the coldest in 10,000 years. We're not going to get nowhere near the Roman period. So in fact, it's just going to get slightly warmer um, which means less people will die from extreme temperatures because a lot more people die from cold than warm. And also that our agriculture is now about 20% more productive and deserts are de de desertifying at the fringes because photosynthesis is improving as CO2 levels increase. So what I would say is, where is this emergency that we're supposed to be worried about in the first place? They shouldn't have held it at all. Mm, they shouldn't have held it at all. Uh, Jim Dale. I'm going to quote the king, if I may. Uh, I'm going to say what he said. This is why it was uh, 
why it was uh, uh, held in the first instance. We are dreadfully far off track on climate. He also used the words starker and darker world. I don't mm. think he minced his words then. I don't think he sort of made them up at the last second. I think he was very earnest in what he said. But, 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 I, but Jim, but Jim or, go on. this is a great quote, but he did fly there. Yeah, he did fly there. And, and let, let's go back to PM Sunak for a, for a, for a second and just say what a PR disaster that was. Um, there's no doubt about that. But, and I'll, and I'll put this but in there, it is nice to be in the studio rather than be on Zoom. And I think the alternative would have been for uh, those many, many thousands of people to hold this on Zoom. I think that's what we're hinting at here. And I think the face-to-face -face and the behind-the-scenes meetings are worthwhile. It's where you but, get but, things but, done. Zoom's just the real is the problem. Point. But the point of it is, is that if you are specifically talking about the climate emergency that you supposedly believe in, why on earth would you fly in a private jet uh, to go all that way to discuss something for four hours and then come back? Uh, and not only that, but why are you flying in a jet if it's that much of an emergency? I, th Jim? I think the, uh, one of the reasons why they fly separately is just in case... Let's just say the no, PM and the that. King, for know example. You know, you that. know all of that. I've security. already said that, but why are you even flying? Well, rowing's a bit of a difficulty to get that far in, in the time that they've why, got. Well, you know, what, I can't, what about, you can't what's put... wrong with social media? What's wrong with well, Zoom? Well, in, the, in exactly the same way as me and Paul are sitting here in the studio and you're, you know, you like people to come into the studio, it's face to face, you get a lot more done, isn't this the sort but, of thing But that's... I'm not talking about climate emergency, I don't, I don't personally believe in it. So well, we, we are talking about the climate and yeah, it's but... nice to be here, I, I like sitting next to you. Yeah, well, that's all no very problem. well, but that doesn't help the CO2 if you actually believe it and you're talking and trying to convince other people to reduce their CO2, then you're flying in a private jet or the, those Mars. Uh, Paul Burgess. Well, I'd like to agree with Brian totally. Everything he just said was sensible. CO2 does not control the climate. That's, that is absolutely certain. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous what's going on. The, uh, I showed a graph in the previous session we had about half an hour ago, which shows that all the climate conferences make no difference at all. I think all four of us probably agree on that. They make no difference at all. If you actually look at the latest AR6 report from the IPCC, you'll see that they say there's no discernible problem with floods, hurricanes, with with droughts, etc. The whole long list. So all this idea of this bad climate happening is not even supported by the IPCC. If you want to look her up, it's in Chapter 12. So you can say that. that that's, you know, that's how bad this is. <coughs> and that point goes to the very heart of the matter. There is no worsening of all these major things. It doesn't exist. The idea that we're having crop failures, we're having this, we're having big floods, we're having big droughts everywhere, and we're causing all this to the third world doesn't exist. In my last video, I, I showed the president uh, uh, of an island sitting in water pleading for more money. You know, the, <laughs> the cabinet of the Maldives years ago held their cabinet meeting underwater in, in aqua suits of aqua suits to get the publicity. Please help us, please give us millions. Today they're building airports costing billions from the Chinese, of course, about a metre above the water. So all of this doesn't exist. And here is the AR6 report. Read it yourself. It's not me saying it. Now, I, w I would love to have gone back to the first speaker there, and who is worse than Jim Dale, by the way. I did a video on him I'm going to put in the link below um, with uh, when, it, when he was interviewed by Neil Oliver, because he's much worse than Jim Dale. He is the ultimate alarmist, I think. And I wanted to ask him, where does your information come from? on this, all this bad weather, because you can't show it. The reason is they can't show me graphs of increasing droughts, because they're not, they're decreasing. They can't show me graphs of increasing hurricanes, because they're not. They can't show me graphs of increasing floods, they're not, but they will quote dam failures, of course, caused by negligence of, of the people looking after the dams in, in Libya. So, uh, forest fires, even that, by the way, is covered by this IPCC report. Here's the list of what the IPCC claim they cannot distinguish any worse frequency of these events. You know, that these events, there's nothing in the historic record they can see that would cause these to be changed from the past, as it were. There's no big difference. Here's the list now. Well, there is the reference. And this is going to be a list of no discernible difference in the frequency of these events. In the historic record, that's emerged from the following. There is the reference for anyone to check. Frost. Well, no more frost, apparently. Mean precipitation. Well, that's rainfall. No more rainfall. And river floods. No more of those either. 
Heavy precipitation and pluvial floods. None of those. Oh, no more landslides, and the earth is not getting any more arid. No more hydrological droughts, agricultural and ecological droughts. No more fire weather. Hmm. Funny that for the forests. Mean wind speed. Um, no more of that. You know, severe wind storms. None of those. No more of those. Snow glacier and ice sheet. No, we haven't detected any more of those. Heavy snowfall and ice storm. No, none of those detected um, a higher frequency. Hail. No, none of that. Snow avalanche, relative sea level, coastal flood, coastal erosion, and marine heat waves. Well, we add on to that ocean acidity. Just to make it clear, when I say no more, I mean no increase in the frequency of these things. In actual fact, in a number of those, there is strong evidence there are decreases. But providing there's no increase, you can hardly say we're trying to rescue the world or pay compensation to it, can you? That, and, or if you look at the crop yield in Africa, which I published, I actually printed some out last night, all the crops are really at record levels in Africa. In so Somalia, we've got record levels so. of crops. Well, well Don, 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 Don is, is actually shaking his head. Why, why are you shaking your head? Well, the EIU think you just produced a report about infl food inflation of the last year, Nana. You, you are aware we've had 20% food inflation. The main, two main reasons for that were the, the explosion in, in fossil fuel prices following the Ukraine crisis. But there are actually extreme weather events affecting the food baskets in, in continent after continent. I'm sorry, but that is just amazing hogwash. Uh, I've just shown you the graph of cereal production in Africa and how amazing it is. Um, so I decided to do some research to find out, well, where are these extreme weather events affecting crops, etc.? I mean, there's always somewhere, I suppose, but I, 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 I could find only alarmist stories like this one here. And this is concerned with the terrible things happening, happening to Brazil's coffee yield. You know, um, terrible, this. You know, I mean, these are signs because of extreme weather. You really got to worry. We got to compensate them. So let's look at world of data again to see how well production of coffee is going. Well, surprise, surprise. Look at how it's growing in each continent. It's really doing very, very well. So it's easy to take isolated tiny things or something and try to distort the information. But there is no evidence to support what they're saying. And so when, when you give them the crop yield charts, these diagrams, they just ignore it and go for their alarmism because it's not to do with extreme weather. It's not even to do with climate. It's to do with controlling people. China, South America, Europe and, and North America. That has meant that the, the food has been disastrously impacted and is now impacting food inflation. We, the temperature this year, Nana, is the highest in 125,000 years. Wrong. It's the hottest in 125,000 years. This man just spouts alarm after alarm, untruth after untruth. Here are the Holocene temperatures. And by the way, on there is plotted the CO2, although in practice this is an underestimate of the CO2 um, because later studies now have shown um, that the way they were measuring tonight's ice cores was wrong. But here we are, just look at the temperatures just in the last Holocene period. All the previous peaks were higher. And by the way, that happened even when the CO2 was lower. The oil companies, the oil company scientists, in the 1970s, predicted by 2024, temperature would be rising by 1.2 to 1.4 degrees yeah. centigrade. It has. And, and well, the you're saying that, but path. I thought Paul Berger's shaking his head. Brian's got his head down, so I don't know what he's thinking. Paul, briefly to you. It's rubbish. Uh, no, I'll, go to, I'll go to Brian Cat because, Brian, you're saying it's rubbish. Why is it rubbish? Well, the, the, this agricultural output for this year is the most it's ever been. Correct. So that is untrue. The yes, 125,000 year, 125, year statement is also totally false. We know, geology knows that it's been a lot warmer during the Holocene optimum period Correct. because it was, it was the Holocene optimum period because it was warmer, two degrees warmer than now. Yeah. It, you know, everything they say, these people, is, is just a denial of the facts. Well, listen, go away. I'm going to have to wrap this up.
Because I, I, but I've got to briefly bring it to Jim Dale because he's going to tell us about the weather. You've got about 20 seconds, Jim. 20 seconds to, to talk say, to about the weather. OK, it's, it's not at my mum's house, I think. She's in right in Oldham. Uh, snow. Snow is coming in to the north and the Midlands. Uh, it will be missing the south, so it'll be wet and miserable and windy and, and slightly milder on Monday. We're going in the right direction as far as temperatures are concerned. <laughs> That's about it. Enjoy the snow if you're going to get it. There you go. Enjoy the snow. Well, listen, uh, but then briefly to all of you, uh, Jim Dale, should they, have flown, should they have flown in private jets, yes or no? Should they have flown in private jets? Should no, they, they should have shared. They should a have shared. More. Yeah. Should, they, should they have even gone by jets at all? Yes, they should. Should There's it be no on Zoom? Way. Should it be on Zoom? No. OK, uh, Paul Burgess, should it be on Zoom? It shouldn't be on anything. It shouldn't be there at all. Brian Catt, should it be on Zoom? What Paul said. Yeah. And uh, finally, to you, Donald, should, what, what do you think? Should it be on Zoom? I would, I would stop 68, I would stop 68,000 of them flying, but I would support 2,000 up, up politicians and diplomats meeting and finally make an agreement that will save us. Yeah, all right. Well, I, I don't think they're going to do that. They're going to have a jolly, they're going to eat good food and stay in five-star hotels and just knock out the carbon as though there's, there's no tomorrow. All right, thank you to all of you. This is GP News on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up, we'll continue with the Great British Debate. But the good news is that sanity is returning, very slowly but gradually, to our world. The president of COP28, um, the UAE Sultan Al Jabir, says the phase out of coal, oil and gas would take the world back into caves. And he is totally correct in that. I mean, there are over 6,000 everyday products around you made using oil. Uh, your mobile phone, your clothing, your zips, your, your kettle, your car, and so on. There's so much there uh, in plastics and silicones and everything else. Even penicillin needs an oil derivative to in the process of manufacturing it. It's right the way through a whole industrial complex. And to do away with that would be, well, the most absurd thing man has ever done and return the world into terrible poverty. And with that, I will leave you. I mean, it's good to leave you with signs of sanity returning. Bye-bye.